And now begins our final chapter of GTA 4 videos, at least in this vein. And that only leaves us with the latter of the two major expansions. The Lost and Damned was very good, but I don't think I enjoyed it as much as The Ballad of Gay Tony. This DLC takes a step back from the gritty atmosphere of Grand Theft Auto 4 in favour of an atmospheric overhaul. Liberty City is transformed into a much more vibrant environment, one that is arguably still Hell on Earth, just a different flavour, with gameplay to match the more light-hearted vibe. Focusing more and more on extreme and ridiculous scenarios with a very strange obsession with helicopters, in contrast to the more grounded experiences in the stories of Nico Bellic and Johnny Klebitz. And that's not out of place when the narrative focuses instead on more superficial elements to Liberty City, while simultaneously tying off the loose ends from Grand Theft Auto 4 and The Lost and Damned. In The Ballad of Gay Tony, we play as Luis Fernando Lopez, a former member of a drug gang turned business partner to Tony Prince, a socialite and nightclub owner in Liberty City, also known as Gay Tony, simply for reasons that should be obvious. And as business partners, these two characters share a very strong bond. And with Tony struggling to keep his business ventures afloat, he makes several sensible decisions and lands under the boot of several loan sharks, which further puts in jeopardy his two nightclubs. In one, you can engage in dancing and innocent door slamming, and in the other, getting smashed pretty much covers it. God bless this game's drunk driving mechanics. Luis naturally is the more level-headed one, endeavours to solve these problems for Tony, and also his mum, who's also in debt to a loan shark, though I technically outsmarted the game on that one. No need for transport. What do you mean that failed the mission? Surely to Christ, that's the problem solved! Ladies and gentlemen, Rockstar Games. We think outside the box, so they can put us right back in it. Anyway, since that didn't work on old mum's front, we've got to enter some illegal cage fighting, and that didn't take anywhere near as long as I expected that subplot to. But it does introduce a cool bit of side content, one in which the fist fighting mechanics are consistently useful for once. Tony's problems, on the other hand, are a touch less straightforward to resolve, with Luis having to work for Tony's loan sharks in order to protect the business, and also his friend. And naturally that rabbit hole comes with copious, senseless, gratifying violence. Ah! But of course, the people Tony are indebted to are not particularly likeable. We have Maury Kibbutz, the older brother to Brucey Kibbutz, and if you thought he was obnoxious in Grand Theft Auto 4, mate, this narcissist is next level. He seems to take pleasure out of making Brucey feel small, and honestly, having an evil older brother makes an awful lot of sense for Brucey explaining why his behaviour in Nico Bellic's storyline is a little bit mental, but also innocent, despite the crimes. He's yearning for the approval of a man he should probably just punch. Spoilers. And then we have Rocco Pelosi, a member of the Ancelotti crime family, loan shark, and professional bigot. And the jobs these characters have in store for Luis can be summarised with one very simple word. Crimes, my favourite. How did you know? And considering our protagonist is controlled by gamers, he proves himself time and time again to be incredibly reliable in sticky situations. And that's not the only thing on Luis's plate. Not only must he navigate Tony's erratic approach to resolving financial troubles, but he also has to aid his drug dealer friends, still slaves to the street lifestyle he now despises. And though he holds no bitterness towards his friends, he does try to steer them away from this path, whilst simultaneously aiding them in continuing down it. Because landing your mates a cosy 9 to 5 probably doesn't make for particularly good Grand Theft Auto gaming. However, there's always a third option if you ask me. Despite Luis not being clean-handed in his current choice of vocation, I find it a bit strange that he would take the time to help his mates with some drug-related crime when that's a life he left behind. And yes, there would be a trickle of hypocrisy in Luis looking down on that lifestyle and refusing to be a part of his crazy mate's schemes, but I think that would have been a nice character facet to explore versus the rather generic content you get instead. But anyway, on top of that, Luis also has to go and be a bouncer at the nightclub. 
it's side content really, so you can ignore it, but you will receive a phone call very often asking why you haven't been around for a bit if you just don't do it. But at least you get a potent digital love life, I guess. Furthermore, Luis is also aiding a fellow named Yusuf, who typically asks us to steal increasingly ridiculous things. I get why you might want a tank, but a subway train? What the fuck are you gonna do with that? It's probably the coolest garden shed ever, but this is Liberty City. Even the rich don't have gardens. Yusuf is a prospective business partner for both Tony and Luis, but he also proves himself to be a genuine friend and ally. He likes owning nice things that only a wealthy person could acquire, so he sends us to steal them for him. Not because he doesn't have the money to buy it as such, but because it's not for sale. For example, an attack helicopter from an arms dealer's yacht. For good measure, sinking the yacht in the process. And you get the idea, through these missions from Yusuf, the gameplay is allowed to enter a new level of absurd. How is it possible? Yusuf is constantly providing us with helicopters. And though they feel very strange when you actually fly them, they can be fun I guess. Although I feel it must be said, I never quite got the hang of landing. But if the helicopter obsession was the height of how absurd the Ballad of Gay Tony's gameplay actually gets, then it wouldn't really have the right to be called crazy at all. It's likely at some point after the helicopter tailing mission that the developers realised that relying on the helicopter so much in a GTA game does get kind of boring. Not to mention tedious if you constantly have to land the fucker. So they devised an ingenious scheme to make this ungrounded approach to Liberty City even less grounded. There are a lot of missions where you'll find yourself jumping out of helicopters or otherwise tall things and using a parachute to land. And parachuting onto the top of a building to carry out an assassination before jumping out the window and using a parachute to land safely is cool. And GTA's hardly the game to be playing if you're looking for strictly grounded realism. And it is fun, so I take no issues there. But I do feel as if the constant use of these mechanics take you out of the chaotic, busy, lived-in, atmospheric world that's been built here. And at this point they can get away with it because you likely know Liberty City like the back of your hand by the time you play this expansion. But this expansion is attempting to give us a totally different perspective on Liberty City than that of Nico Bellic or Johnny Klebitz. It scrubs away the gritty tone of GTA 4 and the Lost and Damned, but the stunting nature of this expansion in my opinion doesn't do enough to characterise this new angle. It's fast paced and dynamic and that makes for incredibly fun gameplay. But unlike the other two stories, you're far less likely to be able to relate to this one. And that's because the focus just simply isn't making it that way. But because it's both got to intersect with Nico Bellic and Johnny Klebitz's storylines, the wackier aspects have to facilitate Louise's parts in those moments. I'm honestly surprised neither Nico nor Johnny Klebitz noticed the helicopter landing on the building. They aren't exactly subtle machines. Besides from this wildly different tone interacting with the tone of GTA 4 and the Lost and Damned, being a bit of a cheap sin, there's not really much else to it. Ordinarily, if you go into a GTA game with a suspense of disbelief, you've kind of already missed the point. The light-hearted approach facilitates very enjoyable gameplay, albeit at least at the expense of the narrative's full potential. However, there is a good focus in this narrative for tying up the loose ends of GTA 4 and The Lost and Damned. For example, we finally see how the Diamond subplot comes to a head, and honestly, where they wind up is fitting considering the massive rigmarole they prove to be for each of this game's playable protagonists. And we also get to see what becomes of Ray Bulgarin, a minor antagonist in Grand Theft Auto 4, and the main antagonist of this expansion. And that is a rather cool finale, in my opinion. It may be a bit daft, but it's cool and plays into the more over-the-top aspects on display throughout the entire storyline. The sea appears to be despawning in very particular places though, but the focus of the narrative doesn't solely hinge on the crazier aspects of the GTA universe, as there are many compelling characters, not least the main two protagonists, the one we play as, and the one the expansion is named after. Tony is an erratic character with a sense of self accustomed to a lifestyle that when he cannot afford leads him to making brash decisions, often with consequences that add to his stresses. Though at times he's incredibly self-serving, he also cares for the people close to him and feels guilt among other negative emotions when something bad befalls one of them. For example, his boyfriend Evan's death or Gracie Ancelotti's abduction. Believing their misfortune is his responsibility and in fairness it kind of is. An insecure man who's impotent in open confrontation, Tony can't really operate effectively without his foil, Luis. Who in many ways is the exact opposite to Tony, which is probably why they get along so well. 
a level-headed and collected man who is capable of making split-second decisions whilst under pressure with a skill set to match, Luis is the go-to man for Tony to depend on when he needs a problem resolved. Fiercely loyal, he will kill for those he cares about without a moment's hesitation, and though his past isn't as compelling as Nico Bellic's, he has a much clearer idea of what he wants out of his present and future, taking a rather uniform no-nonsense attitude with quite literally everybody. Unafraid to voice his opinions, no matter how dangerous somebody might be, and when it comes to a crisis, he figures out exactly what needs to be done and does it, making him Tony Prince's greatest ally. And like most Grand Theft Auto protagonists, he's also alert to the absurdity occurring around him. These two characters, though polar opposites, share an unbreakable allegiance, one the narrative relentlessly tests, as Luis is offered a way out, kill Tony which would be an easy solution for him to a very complex problem. But as a testament to the friendship he shares with Tony, he instead doesn't take that easy option. The one where his friend, who's caused the vast majority of these problems, I might add, doesn't need to die. Which, from a gameplay perspective, allows us to kill more people, but I suppose that's neither here nor there. And with that decision instigating open conflict with Tony's lenders, or at the very least one of them and the remaining threats, it allows Luis to dispatch of the remaining threats, and bring safety back to their joint enterprise. The Ballad of Gay Tony's narrative really isn't its strongest point. Like any good GTA story, it touches down on societal issues, but it's nowhere near as front and center as GTA 4, nor does it have the character focus of The Lost and Damned, but it really isn't the storytelling that gives this expansion its charm. Because if anything, it seems as if this was testing the waters for the tone of Grand Theft Auto 5. At no point in this narrative do you truly feel the pressure you would feel in a real-life equivalent situation. It isn't intended to be taken that seriously, and that's fine, because the Ballad of Gay Tony's inherent wackiness allows Grand Theft Auto 4's gameplay to be more fun than ever. Though I'm not directly keen on this expansion's strange helicopter obsession, I am keen on the dynamics of the gameplay when stacked against the Lost and Damned in GTA 4. And yes, for the most part the gameplay is the same, but it's no longer proportional to a gritty dark tone and you're no longer tethered to a storytelling experience you need to take somewhat seriously. So, The Ballad of Gay Tony pushes well past the limits of believability to allow for gameplay that's, above all else, enjoyable. You'd never catch Nico Bellic parachuting onto the top of a building, killing a man and then parachuting out, it's too much. He'd never steal a tank by dropping it from a helicrane and then evade the authorities somehow, nor would he completely eviscerate a downtown car park, actually maybe he would. But you definitely wouldn't catch Nico Bellic stealing a train, that's utterly bonkers and probably way past borderline nonsensical. But after two rather tame plots, that playground feel to the gameplay where everything's grander and infinitely more insane certainly makes for a refreshing scenario. I suppose its main focus was to ease people into what GTA 5 became? But you can also tell there's intent on switching things up so experiencing the same city for three stories doesn't get boring. After all, the gameplay loop in Rockstar Games isn't immune from becoming repetitive, and though the worst of it these days is often masked by one-off mechanics, it's still good to not be complacent, I suppose. An example of that would be the fact that the missions in The Ballad of Gay Tony are all scored, meaning that you get a greater score the more you adhere to optional objectives, and though you don't have to get a particular score to progress, it's a neat way to add replay value for perfectionists even though I don't doubt it's born from absolutely no imagination whatsoever. Regardless, there are plenty of people out there who will play missions again and again just to get 100% on the score. And though I'm certainly not one of them, I can see why. Furthermore, the implementation of parachutes makes so much more of Liberty City accessible. Whenever you fancy, you can now access areas you simply couldn't before. And the statue of Hillary Clinton has a massive beating heart for some reason. But you get the point, in this expansion, the open world is simply more open than it was before. I still like taking taxis everywhere, mind you. And that's because you really just can't beat a Rochdale tier taxi experience. On the combat front, there are various new weapons, including sticky bombs and this weapon that fires about 200 rounds in 15 seconds. And though the ridiculous weaponry from the Lost and Damned isn't present, there are still plentiful guns that can glue your enemies to the wall. And those sticky bombs have their uses too, considering you can set them and then detonate them independently. But I think the most important aspect to the combat in this expansion are the combat scenarios themselves. Don't mind me while I neck a sprunk mid-fight, 
It's that unbelievability and craziness that allows the combat in this expansion to thrive. And even when a gunfight isn't entirely unbelievable, it's rooted in such absurd context that you can just appreciate it for what it is, gameplay. Which is kind of refreshing every now and then. But aside from Gravitas, the combat experience is largely exactly the same as it was before. After all, it is the same game. Away from that, let's talk about the styling. The UI no longer has the grimy effect of the Lost and Damned, it's now colourful and vibrant. And that's the styling. As for the side content, we have the Drug Wars, where Luis helps his mates do drug wars. And this typically consists of intercepting a rival gang transporting drugs in a vehicle. It can be a bit unpredictable and scuffed on a gameplay front. Not to mention it doesn't really make sense for Luis to be involving himself in this as such. But that's alright, it's not the only bit of side content in the world. You can browse the internet, the undercover lover will be mine. You can also go out and get pissed up with your boys, or you can make booty calls, which is the same as the romance feature in GTA 4 except absolutely nothing happens. You can play golf, because who doesn't want to play golf? You can partake in base jumping, which is honestly very cool, or you can just simply partake in a boogie. Being a nightclub bouncer is an alright way to kill some time, and like any other self-respecting Rockstar game, there are side missions to an extent, and as per usual, they're a bit odd. And if all else fails, you can go and get plastered. If you get too drunk, you'll wake up somewhere random. And then there are triathlons, multi-stage races. You start with skydiving, and then you use a boat, and then you're street racing, which is nice and fun. And when you're racing in a car, you also have nitrous. Nice. After all these years searching, I finally found something fast enough to escape my problems. I only did the story relevant triathlon, I'm not awfully keen on racing in particular, but it exists and it's cool. And of course, how could anybody forget the underground cage fights? This is where boys are baptised in fire and evolve into men. The objective is of course to become the grand champion of this underground arena, and no, you do not get an adoring fan for doing so. <sighs> Let's chill out and have a sprunk. Much better. So to conclude, Grand Theft Auto, The Ballad of Gay Tony is a terrific expansion. It's neither remarkably narratively strong, nor is it weak, but its less intense atmosphere transforms Liberty City into a fun playground, and the gameplay isn't desperate for you to take it seriously, but rather simply enjoy it. It also overlaps nicely with the stories of Nico Bellic and Johnny Klebitz, furthering the lived-in vibe to Liberty City. Its weaknesses include the fact that its saves can overwrite to the main story saves, and its over-reliance on airborne action isn't really my favourite thing in the world. But by far its greatest quality is the fact that it simply embraces the nonsense. And after however many hours playing GTA 4 for these three videos, I was honestly expecting it to get far more tiresome than it did in reality. And that's not just a credit to the quality of The Ballad of Gay Tony, but Grand Theft Auto 4 in general. I have adored finally properly familiarising myself with this game. And yes, I'll probably wind up doing a video on Grand Theft Auto 5 at some point in the near future, but I might decide to properly play some of the older GTA games first, even though I know I'll live to regret that decision, as mission checkpoints only started showing up in GTA 4's expansions. But maybe in those videos I'll come up with something actually worth saying, who knows. But now it's time for me, and Hillary, to conclude today's video. So, thank you all for watching, I really hope that you've enjoyed, be sure to go ahead, leave a like, subscribe, maybe share the channel with your friends and all that wonderful stuff, that would be massively appreciated. And with any luck, I'll be smelling you all very soon with another video at some point, you heard me. But until next time, please take care, and goodbye.